and I thought I was going to. The role I played with the stories that I, that I told. <laughs> and no one yet has. So I approached him and he told me that he was a director and in fact, an Emmy winning director. Um, I do want to say, and we can get into this in the, in the, uh, in oh, welcome to another episode of sales intersection, um, season three, the international tour today. We're joined by, I consider first, my friend, Roberto Hernandez, who um, it only cost me 10 days of meditating from 4 a.m. to 9 p.m. in total silence and only eating two meals and having no form of entertainment. And um, basically one of the most harrowing experiences of my life. Um, <laughs> but the the one of the one of the great things that came out of it was my friendship with Roberto Hernandez because if you experience something like that together you you're lifelong friends so we've actually seen each other uh once or twice uh since since that time which was about eight years ago or something like that and um and it you know and it was fascinating I approached him because because just the way he was going about Vipassana and and, and how just how into it he was and how he allowed himself to be so engrossed by the experience. So I approached him and he told me that he was a director and in fact, an Emmy winning director. Um, and so, you know, uh, on, on Netflix and all this, and I was just, you know, my eyes were just, um, and for, for the, for the film presumed guilty, right. For the documentary presumed guilty. Yeah, the documentary presume guilty. Yeah, that's so. So, um, so anyway, Roberto is is the senior researcher. I and correct me if I'm wrong. At the World Justice Project, where he, he oversees um, various Me Mexico-based projects, right? Is that change? That's correct. No. Okay. Uh, well, I'm I'm on leave from the World Justice Project at this point, but. Um, I'm still an employee at the organization, but I'm not currently doing any work for them. Okay, and and just so people know, the World Justice Project is is advancing the rule of law worldwide, um, and uh, that's actually just what they have on their Twitter. So I didn't get a lot more information than that. But um, so to to add on to the accolades, and we could go on and on with Roberto, but we won't. We'll try to try to spin this um with a little bit more interactivity and some stimulating questions and answers um but in addition to being an emmy award-winning filmmaker for his 2008 feature length documentary film presumed guilty roberto has more than a decade of experience designing and deploying surveys that measure various aspects of criminal justice in mexico he holds a ba in law from uh, um, el instituto Tecnolo uh, tecnologico te 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 tecnologico uh, Autonomo de Mexico, um, an LLM. You got it right. <laughs> got it right. In yeah. comparative law from McGill University of Montreal, and he is a PhD candidate at the Goldman School of Public Policy at the University of California. And just to be clear, I, I do not have a PhD, but I, I do read a lot of books by people that have them. Um, anyway, um, so you were trained as a lawyer in Mexico and Canada and had no, and I bet this, this probably makes a lot of, of, of people mad that because there's so many people interested in, in Hollywood and film and, and to, to be what, what they would give to be an Emmy winning director. Um, and if, if this story is true, then I'm sure that, that they brings in a little bit of anger, but, um, you had no particular interest in cameras or film until you found yourself collecting statistics in the basement of Mexico city's superior court, 
um, which houses the archive legal cases of, of one of the largest cities in the world. Um, and what you saw inspired you um, and uh, to make El Tunnel, uh, a, a short documentary that presented scandalous facts about Mexico's justice system and was broadcast on several television stations throughout Mexico. So as a result of the support the film received in 2008, Mexico's Congress passed the most significant amendment to its constitutions due to process clause requiring public trials and the presumption of innocence. But um, Roberto, um, at the time, currently a graduate uh, student in public policy at the University of California, Berkeley, noted the implementation of this reform is, was hardly progressing at all as the Mexican government um, was, uh, remained ostensibly focused on an offensive against drug cartels. So in 2006, um, the desperate friends and relatives of, of an inmate read about El Tunnel and contacted um, Roberto um, pleading for help. The experience of filmmaking was fresh in, her, in, in Roberto's mind and it seemed natural for him to record that first meeting. Thus began a two-year production adventure that resulted in presumed guilty, a story that changed young people's lives. So uh, that's how I introduce you. And there are various social profiles, websites with, with a blurb on who Roberto Hernandez is, but keeping in mind your current focus and passions, can you give my listeners an idea of how you'd sculpture your about me, let's say with a recipe of a little bit of the beginning, earlier on, the middle, the any times, and up until now? So you'd like me to tell um, a little bit of biography? Let's say let's say like, let's say that you're at let's say that you, let's say that you're at a family get together and um, you you have a cousin that doesn't know about all this history and they say, What Roberto, what are you all about? What oh what, what story do you tell? <laughs> wow. Um so um, the last time I saw my cousin, I was studying law <laughs> and I thought I was going to, um, you know, just working maybe in the corporate world. I didn't imagine I was going to be working in criminal cases. And, um, and then I got scared about, about um, um, living a life that was not going to be meaningful, um, where I would be focused on making uh, money or working for these big corporations, and I um, slowly drifted away from 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 the law. I even thought about leaving uh, Mexico, and eventually I did. And I went to to study um, a master's in comparative law in Canada. But but frankly, my aim was kind of to to escape some of the realities of my country that I found um, difficult to deal with. Um, and eventually I was summoned back. I was invited to do this survey to criminal files in the basements of, of, of the Mexico city courts. And the realities I discovered there, um, I, I feel um, defied um, a, a description with numbers and with uh, percentages. And I thought a picture would be worth more than a thousand words. And I eventually brought a camera to, to the basement and I took some photos. I got um, scolded for doing that. Um, because we were doing a survey, but um, finally I persuaded um, courts to allow me to come in with video cameras and to film um, um, the basement of the courts. And that grew into, into, into this um, um, professional development as a, as a filmmaker, which grew and grew uh, through the years. So I recently published a series with Netflix that is called Reasonable Doubt, A Tale of Two Kidnappings. But about a decade ago, I made a documentary film that, that had the unlikely fortune of ending up in cinema theaters. I'm going to and, put this in the uh, chat just so people can um, can watch it. Read it out. Um, a tale of two of kidnappings. Two kidnappings. Um, just so people that are watching this can can uh, check that out. Yeah. So. Um, um, that's on Netflix and it's available everywhere in the world where you can see Netflix on with uh, subtitles with uh, dubbing in your own language and, and but before that I made presunto culpable presumed guilty 
which um, is both now a directing, decade old. In both directing, uh, directing capacity? Yeah, both of them I directed. And because I don't have uh, training in film, I typically work with co-directors who help me um, craft it into, in, into a film. But it's my investigation and my style of, 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 of telling a story. And um, so that has um, you know, grown in a, a serendipitous way, really. Um, Presunto Culpable, for example, became the highest crossing documentary in Mexico when it was in cinema chains because it was banned. It was ban banned by the courts um, three weeks into its theatrical run. The judge didn't like it and they thought they had arguments to, to halt the screening of the film. They felt it was to protect the rights of a person who appears in the film. I feel it's censorship and I think I'm right. And so the cases ended up at the Mexican Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said that we were right. Um, but in any case, the, the censorship did help the film gain a, a huge viewership. It's estimated that about 30% of Mexicans saw Presunto Culpable on, on cinema screen. Um, um, and it's this story of a young man, you know, who's falsely accused of a murder. But go ahead, Eric. Uh, no, no, um, that, that's, and we can get into that. But it's, it, it, it's for me, you know, uh, a gringo in, in California, um, a white guy with, you know, uh, blondish brown hair, blue eyes that has, hasn't faced discrimination in, in his life, basically. Um, but I, I do know, you know, bordering Mexico and, 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 and growing up in a in for, for 18 years in an area where it was 75 percent um, uh, uh, Spanish speaking and living in Spain and Costa Rica, go, going to Costa Rica in high school. Um, I've always had a fascination for the Latino culture um, and the ability to communicate with Spanish speakers. So. I feel like that has allowed me to um, at least have a, a pulse, you know, a, a, a touch on on what's going on. Um, it and it seems to me what was shocking it was that that you um, and maybe you see it this way, maybe you don't. That you accomplished so much in the court system, um, and I know that in in reading about your history that you. Uh, you compared the different um, Mexican states and how how very different they were. Um, for example, Chihuahua and Mexico City, Chihuahua um, uh, having a rate of ninety four percent of justice showing up to to court for cases, um, and Mexico City twenty percent. Do you think that a lot of what played out for you and a lot of the decisions? Um, were based on location or luck or or were, were you very deliberate about um you know where how you went about this process um to ensure that you had the highest probability of success wow oh, well i i would say mexico is a huge country and i i i think the role i played with the stories that I, that i told was providing a narrative that, that um, enabled other advocates to, to do what they knew needed to be done. So I, I wouldn't say that I, um, I, I did participate in legislative discussions, for example, and I did help craft um, the due process clause of Mexico's constitution. Um, but that was very deliberate, very specific work. And then the, the task of implementing this legal changes um, in some cases, even preceded that constitutional amendment that, that I'm describing. So, for example, in Chihuahua that you mentioned, there were people pi doing pioneering work, and um, um, the 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 woman who is responsible and deserves credit for implementing these reforms in Chihuahua, her name is Patricia Gonzalez, and she's a very dear friend. And, and Patricia did it at tremendous personal cost. She did basically all the, the right reforms. Most of the right reforms that need to take place in Mexico were um, tested out in Chihuahua by Patricia Gonzalez. She um, did the, the, the adversary trials, um, the, the style of uh, trial litigation that 
we see in the United States, but without the jury, um, she created that system for Chihuahua. Mexico uh, used to have um, a secretive criminal trial system where um, there's exchanges in writing between the litigants and the judge, and the judge reads these exchanges. There's no um, dynamic, fluent process going on in the in the old style of uh, criminal trials. And Patricia created a system where you couldn't bring documents to the courtroom. Um, there would be an oral exchange. Um, you know what we see in the movies: objection, Your Honor. You cannot ask this little question, etc. This kind of um, more fluent um, crossfire between litigants to help um, a court ascertain the truth. And um, she implemented databases to handle evidence. She uh, trained the police, um, trained the prosecutors um, so that they could litigate the cases in this new court environment. Um, and she did so um, um, inspired partly by the, the high rate of um, um, homicides of, of women for which Chihuahua became famous over a decade and a half ago. Um, and so gradually some scholars in Mexico began to notice, but they saw Chihuahua as an outlier. It could only be done there and maybe even it's illegal. And so there was this kind of negativity about the change um, that Patricia was uh, trying to, to, or enacting, she succeeded in enacting these changes. And, and, and therefore, um, they were unwilling to, to try it out nationally. And I came in with presumed guilty with a Mexico City case that uh, uh, you know, laid bare all the inadequacies of, of the judicial process that was going on in the capital of Mexico. And then the opponents of reform became defenseless. Um, there was nothing to defend in, in, in the old justice system. And, um, and reforms then therefore had to be implemented. And it was like, it came in waves. It was first a constitutional amendment that took place in 2008. And eventually Mexico, like the United States, we are a federal state. So um, as a federal state, um, each state has its own code of criminal procedure or, or, or its own law, you know, uh, stipulating how trials should, should take place. And the, those um, state codes were eliminated and Mexico has now one single national code of criminal procedure. Um, so that there's a homogeneous list to try to pull. And it's a chamber over um, six, seven, eight years that it's still in progress. I, I imagine there is a point where um, you were you were somewhat aware of the dangers that would come with um, uh, the 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 efforts and the and the focus that you would be that would be involved in what you'd be pursuing um, you know at, at some point in the in the very beginning um, and also dreams uh, a dream of of what the outcome might be um, can you speak to uh the trajectory of of what what that maybe that dream was of of if i do all this this is the outcome i i hope to happen and if there's a gap between that and what actually happened what are you most proud of to this point i'm i'm very proud of having helped um a few persons who were wrongly accused regain their freedom by telling their story of, of, of what happened, um, of what happened to them specifically. Um, and I'm very proud of having um, enabled a, a wide portion of the Mexican public to see their courtrooms at work for the first time in their lives um, and to, to be able to have empathy for those who are being accused of a crime. Um, Mexico has a, a, a crisis of its rule of law systems and um, the, the police do not investigate crime effectively. Um, the prosecutors are, have, have very low um, success rates at trying out cases and, 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 and winning them. Um, so a few cases do go to court, but the few that do go to court, they're usually uh, with tainted evidence, with confessions obtained under torture, with um, manufactured evidence. And so they're unreliable convictions when they 
um, reach the adjudication stage and, and the court decides these cases. So um, um, I think the, the work I've done has helped people consider the idea that they may be falsely accused. When people go out on the street in Mexico, they usually um, are frightful of being the victims of crime but they used to be unaware that the possibility of being falsely accused is, is very real, it's very frequent, and it can have very damaging um, effects and very difficult to, 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 to overcome an, a false accusation. So um, um, I think I planted this idea in the imagination of people, and then therefore um, people are more willing to fight for due process or um, to understand that we need human rights, to understand that we need presumption of innocence and to understand that we need a professional police, not just uh, brutes who are gonna beat out um, confessions out of, of, of those who are detained. So that's what I'm proud of. I think um, the change in, in, the, in the ideas and that people acquired a more sophisticated understanding of a system as a result of the story that I've told. That's well, that's that's fascinating and, and you should be extremely proud of yourself. Um, let me ask you this, and maybe it's it's evolved or changed since the the, uh, the beginning, but is there a, a legal system internationally that you um, you look up to that you think is is eons ahead of the rest of the world? No, <laughs> and no and yes. So I uh, um, I like bicycles. I don't probably this is not a good segue into this, but I like bicycles, but um, I like specific components of bicycles. Um, and it's like that with legal systems. Um, so there's no perfect bike, but there's a bike that has you know the carbon belt and the right kind of pedals and you know the um, the suspension seat and um, and um, the right kind of um, basket to carry whatever you know um so i'm fascinated by machines and i look at legal systems like like machines and so for example i admire from norway the 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 um training that they give for police officers to to question the those who they investigate they have very very um, very advanced um training for the police officers um i think they're beyond um and the rest of the world, you know, in, in their thinking. Um, and I, for example, don't like what the United States is, is allowing and, and doing. In the US, for example, it is possible to lie to a suspect within the context of an interrogation. And this is illegal in many parts of Europe, for sure in Norway, it's illegal in Germany. Um, but then, for example, um, Dallas, Texas, has uh, the police department in Dallas, Texas implemented a good eyewitness identification procedure. Um, they got inspired by, by the Innocence Projects that detected that a, uh, there was a high number of uh, misidentification by eyewitnesses and they used science and uh, designed a new process to, to conduct um, the identifications. And so I, I, I would like that part of, of the system in, in the ideal system that I would build. Um, the United Kingdom um, has a wonderful law since 1984. Um, the title of the law is the Police and Criminal Evidence Act. And um, you know, instead of having courts decide what how the police powers should be exercised, they realized that they could have a, a, a greater effect, a more civilizing effect, if there was a piece of legislation that told the police uh, kind of a script, like an actor's given a script a script for the police and how they should behave when they stop a person, when they search a person, when they search a vehicle, what should they record, who should have access to that record. Um, um, when, when people are taken into custody, this legislation tells uh, the police how often should they be fed, um, uh, how many hours should they be allowed to sleep, uh, at what times should a detective have access to them um, to question them, um, not at 2 a.m. in the morning, for example. So there's a lot of um, rules put in place that have a civilizing effect that prevent uh, 
harm um, to be used as a tool to extract um, incriminating evidence from, from those who are detained or in police custody. And so I like that, that part of the system. And so on, you know, for there's many, many examples I could go on about this. I don't think there's a perfect legal system. I think there's systems that um, have more advanced components than others and that we could build a nicer system for us all. And uh, I'm sure you, you've been in touch with um, what's been going on in the United States over the last uh, three years, Black Lives Matter, um, a lot of protests in the streets. Um, a lot of efforts to change change the system, but do you have any? I mean, first of all, where do you put the United States on the spectrum of, let's say, Norway is number is is the top of the totem pole? Um, where where is the United States on that totem pole? And do you, do you, given all the trials and tribulations that we've been going through, and we've been going probably through them for century for uh, you know decades. Um, but it's been televised now. Um, do you have hope that there that there will be immediate change, change in five years, change in ten years? I think the United States has the right tools to enact change, um, and but it hasn't used them recently. Um, th th there's a history of Supreme Court decisions that that have had a very strong positive effect in the justice system. For example, the case Miranda versus Arizona um, that set out what rights people have in interrogations. You know, you have the right to remain silent in court of law. Um, and knowing the rights that you have, do you want to speak to me? That Those warnings and, and, and the, wave, uh, the waiver that, that the police needs to obtain in order to interrogate a person without an attorney present um, comes uh, straight out of the, the Miranda decision. Um, in its time, it was seen as a landmark case, but the elements that were in that decision had, had been gutted out by subsequent Supreme Court decisions or, um, or precedents. And, um, and so I think um, something as, just as strong needs to happen. Um, a lot of police powers are um, defined at the level of the police department and not by legislation in the US. So it's difficult to have a standard procedure for how to interrogate someone, how to um, um, search a car, how to conduct an eyewitness identification parade. Um, so this makes a homogeneous uh, legal system difficult without without either a Supreme Court willing to take on a case that um, says something more strong or without a national aim at having legislation that's, that has a standardizing effect. Maybe, you know, uh, some, some people would think I'm saying crazy things, but, uh, but, but these procedures that I'm describing, um, when you look at the science, they need to be so detailed in order to prevent error that I can't imagine anymore that a Supreme Court could take the, on the task of, of um, laying out what the rules should be. Um, for example, eyewitness identifications, they need to be extremely detailed. Otherwise you, you, it can cause all kinds of errors. Um, and so I, I hope that there will be the realization that this can't be left up to police departments. It's really, um, that's a crazy idea. Um, the police are not scientists. They need to rely on what the scientists can bring to the table. And with a problem as complex as racial bias in the justice system, you need even more science in order to be able to craft procedures that prevent um, the, racial, the racial biases that, that are very obvious in the United States. So, um, so it's not a good, uh, in, in many ways, it's not a good example of, of, um, um, of what to look at in terms of, uh, of reform. Yeah. Occasionally, you have something in San Diego, something in Dallas, um, or something in New York. But um, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not an expert in the United States, but um, the progress has been slower than it, than it should be. Yeah, um, sure. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm going to start somewhat, somewhat wrapping up here, because you know, just the attention span of people in podcasts, you know, they, they'll, 
they might give you 30 minutes, but not much more. Um, yeah. So are, are you pretty much all finished with your with responsibilities with reasonable doubt? With the project reasonable doubt, a tale of, of two kidnappings? Are your responsibilities complete? Oh, uh, they broke a little bit. Are you there? Yeah. Yeah, sorry, uh, the internet is a little spotty. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, um, I, I was I was I was gonna be asking you what what's next on the horizon, what's the next focus, but are you are you, you are have you completed your responsibilities with reasonable doubt, a tale of two kidnappings? I'm done with that film. It's uh, in the sense that it's delivered to Netflix, but but it's an incomplete story in in with respect to to, to regaining the freedom to some of the men who are the protagonists of, of that film. Um, so three of them are still in prison. They were sentenced to 50 years. Um, and whoever has seen the series, they will know that they're innocent, um, that they don't deserve to be there. And so a lot of my work has gone into, into explaining to authorities what they need to do or what they could do to, to help these men walk out and to prevent other cases like this from ever happening again. Um, so yeah, so it's an incomplete story, but also very tragic and very angering. Um, and I think it would whoever sees this, sees this film will come out with an, a greater understanding of the challenges that Mexico is facing right now. And I think it would be great if it had a great, you know, a good viewership in the United States, um, because then the understanding between our nations will grow, and. Um, we can perhaps prevent this kind of discourse of let's build a wall between Mexico and the US, which uh, really doesn't help at all to solve the problems that we have as neighbors. Um, mm -hmm. And instead to have a more compassionate view of the, 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 the stage at which Mexico is with um, its justice system and the challenges we are facing and how the US can help. Because frankly, a lot of the, the work I do has been made possible with the support of the people of the United States and the US taxpayers. Um, so grants from the MacArthur Foundation, for example, have enabled me to do my work, but also grants from um, the US government, from USAID or from the State Department. And um, then also, of course, the possibility of having exchanges with, with uh, experts in the US. My mentors are in the US. My, I studied um, uh, public policy at UC Berkeley, as you uh, mentioned at the beginning. So um, I, I think uh, my relationship, at least personally with the US has been uh, one that is very fruitful and very enriching. And I still have a lot to learn from Americans. And so what's, um, what, how are you spending your days now? What's, what's the next, uh, the, the, the next reasonable doubt or project? <laughs> or can you, can you say? Um, yeah, I can say, I think uh, I'd like to what I was sharing during the podcast is, look, Norway has this good component and uh, Dallas has this other good component and the UK and France, et cetera. Um, but I'd like to be able to, to show it to, to people, to, to be able to go into police stations and to film these procedures so that we can all see what's there to learn from France or the UK or Norway uh, or the Netherlands. Um, and then it would become more concrete and perhaps uh, it may inspire some to to try it out and why don't we put it in the law in our country i think it's it's um great to copy ideas that work or, yeah. or to emulate ideas that work so that's what i'd like to do and i'm looking for funds for for um uh, to start that kind of that kind of work and i've initiated uh, some contact with some of these governments to see if they will allow me to begin filming them with the aim, the aim of, of sharing the good work they're doing. Yeah, that, that's not a bad angle, um, getting money from them so you can show the world how good they are, <laughs> um, <laughs> right? Um, so this is what I like to call rapid fire um, questions, just uh, three or four questions uh, that are, are not really re too relevant to what we've been talking about. but. Um, uh, a, a small Roberto Hernandez asked, you know, uh, what do you want to be when you grow up? What would he have said? Oh, 
oh my god an inventor an yeah. inventor uh, of, i of, thought i was gonna be an inventor of, of anything and of anything a crazy scientist i don't know and I, I didn't think i was going to be a lawyer or a filmmaker or working in the criminal justice system i i thought i was going to be an inventor of things how long did that last uh, um for years actually <laughs> <laughs> till now yeah and i still imagine machines in my head yeah yeah an inventor of bicycles who would have been i think that's funny that's <laughs> funny um mentors oh. <laughs> what about mentors mentors that kind they're of very mind. important to me mentors are very important to me and i um seek, seek mentorship and um uh Chuck Weiselberg at the UC Berkeley School of Law, um, Eugene Smolensky at the Public Policy School. Um, but in other areas of life, um, you know, um, um, meditation, you know, our, our teacher in the, in, in the Vipassana courses that, that we took. Um, so yeah, there's, there's way too many to mention here, but they're essential. Without mentors, what can we do? Yeah. What can we learn? Agreed. Agreed. Somebody, we need somebody to believe in, that, that, that we can do something meaningful in this life. And then, then we actually can do something if people believe in us. Uh, I am interested to hear if, if you still meditate, but I, I wanted to know um, maybe one or two things you do outside of work that really brings up your game at work. Cycle. I cycle for... I have attention deficit disorder, so I need to do a lot of physical activity in order to keep myself focused. So I cycle for a long time, for long stretches, uh, whenever I can. And um, so maybe sometimes 30 kilometers or 50 kilometers in, in a go. And it's it's really fantastic because it, it is like meditation. You know, you're trying to keep your have to be very present in what you're doing. And then that enables me to have a creative process. And recently, beyond cycling, I've discovered that jumping in cold water, um, you know, really, really is uh, something to, to try. It makes you focused. It makes you very present um, in, to be in the here and now when, you know, you think you're going to die, but you don't die. <laughs> so what, you, have, you have like a river a outside? Bit. You have like a river? Where do you participate? Yeah, in? yeah you know, where in whatever, um, wherever in the Netherlands where I can find, I'm in the Netherlands now, wherever I can find um, um, cold water, which is nearly everywhere, the cold water that is clean, I'll, you know, take my clothes off and jump and um, try to stay in the for at least seven minutes. And it has a really, really nice effect in the rest of your day. I, um, for, the, for the last maybe 12 to 15 years, Every single day in the morning, uh, I end my shower with a three-minute freezing cold shower, um, and I and I and I love it. it. It's it's better than coffee, better than anything else. Um, so that's uh, that's great. Well, hey, um, anything, Roberto, you want to plug, you want to promote, you want to um, emphasize to my listeners before we go? Yeah, I. I... You know, I would like everyone who's listening to watch Reasonable Down. It's not an easy film to watch. And maybe I would venture to say that the beginning maybe is a little bit slow, but it grows and it grows and it grows and, and you end up really angry at what you watch. And I know it's probably not the kind of journey you would want to have for Saturday or Sunday or a Friday afternoon, but it is necessary. And I think... Um, if, if you watch it, you will help um, these men and you will help me. And maybe whoever's listening knows somebody who knows somebody at the US Congress, at the Foreign Affairs Committee, who are making the decisions of what to fund in Mexico and what rule of law projects to, to, to advance. And uh, so if you could recommend this film to them, then we oh. will all be better neighbors. Yeah. Because then, if there's greater understanding in what's happening in Mexico, uh, wiser decisions get made, more compassionate decisions get made, and then things can improve. 
And sure. um, I think the U.S. can have a very positive influence in, in what goes on in Mexico with that kind of perspective. Got it. So no, noted. Not a not a uh, first date type of um, uh, documentary or, or, or series, but maybe maybe one for not at all. <laughs> <laughs> a third, a third date. <laughs> a third, maybe yeah, maybe a third date. Um, and, a, and a weird one at that. But yeah, I would I will definitely promote. Oh yeah, you're right. Maybe a fourth. <laughs> <laughs> that's the real test here that's that you know she's either in or out if she like you know how that goes um uh i will promote this and promote uh the reasonable doubt and um and we will of course be in touch after editing it's right. been a pleasure a true honor roberto to have you on the show and and love seeing your smiling face um great to, i wish which we have, um, you know, uh, the gaps aren't weren't so long between seeing each other, but let's let's try to keep in touch uh, a little more frequently, huh? I'd love to. <laughs>